Education to order, ask everybody present to rise and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is the portion of our meeting reserved for public comments. If there's anyone in the crowd today that would like to address the board publicly, please raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the next agenda item, the consent agenda. There are two items. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions, additions, or corrections? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> it passes. So we have any lots on the agendas. We'll start with uh, Mr. Nelson's superintendent's report. So the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction has um, proclaimed that this week is Adult School Crossing Guard Recognition Week. Um, so the proclamation reads, uh, whereas Wisconsin's adult school crossing guards provide an invaluable service in helping to ensure the safe passage of our youngest, most vulnerable pedestrians, children walking between home and school, and whereas adult school crossing guards typically serve with a dedication that discounts the rigors of harsh weather, split shifts, and heavy traffic, and whereas for more than five decades, adult, adult school crossing guards have served communities across Wisconsin, and that service has helped to drive down the rates of young pedestrian deaths and injuries despite increases in traffic volume, and whereas adult school crossing guards add to the effectiveness of the student safety patrol members which, with whom they often serve and whose activity they help direct, and whereas adult school crossing guards help reinforce, reinforce in the minds of the young people they assist the importance of traffic hazard identification and safe street crossing behavior. Therefore, be it resolved that January 22nd through 26, 2018 be declared adult school crossing guard recognition week in the state of Wisconsin. So uh, we do thank all of our um, crossing guards for keeping our kids safe and um, their hard work that they do and some bitter temperatures on um, helping our kids stay safe. So we want to um, make sure that you thank your crossing guards if you walk to school or when you're driving by, wave at them and be friendly to them. Um, they provide a great service for us and we want to appreciate them. So, um, and then also um, the next two items, uh, Mr. Manti was not able to be here tonight and he was going to present for these. Um, so I apologize that a couple of these students, I may not have their name exactly accurate. Um, he had a recent surgery and so wasn't able to, uh, to, to be here tonight. He's fine, but um, he was exhausted coming back to work. Um, so we have a newly chartered National Business Honor Society um, that's just been started at Grafton High School. Um, and there are students that are going to be um, inducted on Wednesday, January 31st from 6 to 6.30. They're doing an induction ceremony in the upper part of the auditorium. Um, but we want to uh, recognize Danny Ochter, Elizabeth Huertas, Katie Lamb, Lila Teca, Mike Wilms and Sabrina Yang. So congratulations to those students um, for um, being inducted in the National Business Honor Society. And then last week, um, the Grafton Lions did their citizenship award, their annual citizenship award. Um, I unfortunately was ill and not able to attend. I know Mr. Kaler was there and, and um, uh, spoke very highly of the students. Bob Hoffman had sent us a picture that we've used on social media um, to recognize those students as well. Um, but Abigail Sabolka, Gretchen Geyser, Jenna Grandinetti and Jenna Kloss were the students being recognized um, by the Grafton Lions for their citizenship award. And I know last year hearing the accolades of the students was, was great to hear and I'm sure it was no um, difference this year for those students. Very impressive to yeah. see what they do academically and ex through extracurriculars too. Yeah, so what they do academically as well as their extracurricular pieces giving back to our community. So congratulations to those students and representing our high school and our community um, very well. And then last week was the Wisconsin State Education um, Convention. Um, myself and Topher were down there on Wednesday and Thursday. Diana came down on Thursday for some sessions. Um, Ms. Walls and Ms. Miela also came down on, on Thursday. They were down there on Friday and heard the governor speak. Um, we had a meeting with Hoffman, so we weren't able to go down on Friday. But it's an opportunity to hear some sessions from various people. One of the things um, that we heard, we went to a legislative uh, update, um, and one of the pieces that we heard is similar to what we're talking about with our budget projection, is to be conservative with our budgeting, um, not knowing what the next budget will be um, without uh, knowing. And so the, definitely the, the legislative update was to say to all districts to be conservative, looking ahead to the future with uh, not knowing what kind of increase there may be or may not be, Per pupil, um, so we have the biennial budget um, this this year and next year. So we know what that increase is, but it may or may not occur in the future. So um, good good feedback there. I went to one on um, from the Elmbrook School District about promoting the district and and some of the different things that they do and um, really align well with 
some of the things that we want to do in our district as well with promoting some of the changes that have occurred and ways to do that, whether it's through a real litter lunch or various things of, um, we've talked about um, bringing back the, uh, the highlighter and keeping the um, various, how do we keep chalkboard, excuse me, the chalkboard, um, back to our community and keeping, how do we keep track, uh, keep contact with parents that don't have kids um, in our school or, or just regular citizens in our community that, that don't have any children at all. So how do we continue that discussion? We engage them a lot with the referendum. How do we continue doing that? So some ideas that we'll be bringing forward to, to keep doing that. Um, but it's a great opportunity to interact and um, 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 build some rapport with other superintendents as well as hearing what other districts are doing, um, reinforcing some of the things that we're doing as well. So, um, so that's my update. Okay, thanks. One last thing I would say is the, it's not on the agenda, but the Super Bowl is coming up um, for CEF on, um, on CEF on the, the, the um, <laughs> I got all kinds of things going through in my mind. It's not on my thing. I'm like, the Super Bowl is at the Cedars on Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they have bowling completed. Yeah. Do they have I, any I, more? There might be one or two more slots open yeah. for teams if anyone wants to make a team. I, I saw something on social media that showed board members from last year. Um, there was a, you know, challenge. I think so. I don't know if the board has another team they participating. Do. They do. Okay. You have to defend the championship. You have to defend the championship. <laughs> there was something on social media showing an interesting yeah. picture. So I saw that and shared that. So, um, but that's an exciting thing and a great opportunity. Um, so make sure you purchase a raffle ticket. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, there'll be all like kinds of fun less things. Less than 50 raffle tickets left. So oh, great. And they're only selling 250. Okay, so 250 at $100 a piece for a $10,000 grand yes. prize. Yep. So great opportunity to support our students um, that they do with us, and so we want to make sure you do that. Okay. Great, thanks. Yep. Okay, thanks. So we're lucky to have the Woodview Elementary School presentation tonight. Mr. McMahon, I'll let you take it over. Well, thank you for letting us come present. Um, we want to take this opportunity to think about new things that are happening at Woodview and showcase some of the cool, exciting new things that we're either piloting or trying this year. Um, and so, while school goals aren't new, we've had those all along. That's not anything new. Um, passion projects are something new, and Seesaw is also something new. But I do want to quickly recap our school goals and do um, some justice to that, because there are some new components to that. In the past, we've always had a reading and math goal. And our reading and math goal are, are tied to growth. We want our students to, to continue to show growth that, that increase um, from growth from fall to spring. For example, in the area of reading, or I'm sorry, of math, we want 67% of our students to meet or show their growth on map from fall to spring. The other side of our math growth goal is we want our students that are getting extra intervention or extra support in the area of math to also show growth, um, knowing that we're impacting students through what we call eye time in the area of math, reading. We're also impacting them in the other areas, which is why we have students here to present in a second. So, like I said, math is not a new goal. Reading is not a new goal. So I'm trying to keep you on the edge of your seat. Reading, we also have goals. 95% um, of our students in 5K through 5th, we want to see a growth of one writ point in the area of math. Math, that's that low hanging fruit. We want to see some growth. We also look from spring to spring goals in the area F and P. We want our students to show some growth. 70% of our students, we really want to see that fall to spring grow, growth in the area of MAP. Um, we just finished our winter MAP window, so we'll check in on that mid-year mid growth goal to see how we're doing in the area of, of reading. But what is new this year is we added some new goals connected to behavior and communication. That was something we really thought about as we thought of our tier or our, our Title I school-wide system, is we wanted to tie some growth to behavior and communication. Each day, um, we focus on our positive things that we're doing within behavior. We have the positively awesome Woodview students. We have pause tickets that we're handing out to think about the positive things that are doing, think students are doing throughout the school. But on the negative side, we also want to reteach when there's opportunities for behavior to be retaught. So we have two systems. We have minor behaviors and major behaviors. The major behaviors are the students that come see me um, for what we would consider maybe um, uh, maybe more serious. For example, a fight on the playground as a result in a conversation with me in the office. Um, we want to go through some restorative practices having a conversation, and so we want to see some growth, and we would hope that those students don't come back to the office again. So our behavior goal is that we want 85 or 80 percent of our students, K-5, to respond to our Tier 1 interventions or Tier 1 behaviors having zero or one major BTF. 
and we are certainly successful at this point. We have 95% of our students with zero or one major visit to talk to me. Um, I'll keep you in the loop on how that's going, but last year we were able to exceed that 80% in our growth, and our goal is uh, to exceed again this year. Our other goal, which is really com important and connected to some of the things that we're doing tonight, is tied to communication. We want to find multiple ways to engage parents, get them into the school, and do some things that showcase our students' learning. One opportunity was just this last week. I brought some fourth and fifth grade parents in to look at some data. We had 10 fourth grade parents and 11 fifth grade parents come in and talk, and we talked about data. We talked about their students' goals, and we talked about, believe it or not, ACT scores, um, talking about college um, entrance um, and it was a really exciting night but we want to find other ways to showcase our student learning and one of those things was through our passion projects so passion projects was an idea that Jen Griffith and I came up with um, this fall knowing that our I time is this opportunity for students to work on math and writing and social studies and get some enrichment opportunities and intervention opportunities we thought what can we do differently um, our third through fifth grade students share a time 30 minutes a day all of our third and fifth third through fifth grade students have this block that we wanted to really get them together and start thinking about extending their learning. So Jen had this great idea called Passion Projects. It morphed from Genius Hour, which I know you heard heard from the GES staff talk about. But I wanted a couple students to kind of talk us through what those projects were, um, what they did, and so you can see. We had a, a number of third grade students, a number of fourth grade students, and a number of fifth grade students go through this process of developing their passion into either a model, a presentation, a poster, and we really took kind of what we learned from High Tech High in the movie last year to then bring parents into a showcase event. So we brought a little piece of that showcase event to you tonight, and so I'd like to invite a couple of my Woodview friends up to present their passion projects to you. So, Matthew Eipert, why don't you come up? His passion project is a model, and he's brought it with us tonight. And so, I'm going to take you through some questions, Matthew, and you can answer for the board. What was your passion? Um, exploring the parts of a computer. So, you had lots of time to research on a computer, right? What are some things that you found on the computer about the computer? That there's a whole ton of different parts in a computer. Yeah. Do you want to share some of those parts? Or are you ready to go? Mm-hmm. This here is a hard drive and it stores all the information that you put in the computer and some examples are videos, programs, and pictures. cards called RAM and they remember everything you put on the computer but once you shut it down it goes away. If you have more RAM your computer will work faster. This is a video card it connects the computer to a monitor or projection screen. This is a motherboard. It runs all the computer, all the parts of the computer plug into the motherboard. It's kind of like the brain of the computer. This is a DVD player. It plays DVDs and CDs. And this is a fan that keeps the computer from overheating. So Matthew, along with all of his peers, presented to a group of parents that came in and asked questions of their presentation. We also talked a lot about what can we do with these passions. Do you plan on using your knowledge of computers in the future, Matthew, in a Maybe. career someday? Maybe. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Matthew on his research and his passion of computers? Uh, Matthew, can you hold one of those things up so I can take a picture of you, buddy? Can you hold <laughs> hold one of those pieces up and then look, look over here? <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> Great, thanks, buddy. All right, let's give Matthew a round. Of Great job.
presenter is Max Mugari, and he is working on, what did we say, this is? Uh, well, it's a robot. It's, 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 it's number 17, it's model number 17. Uh, is it went through a ton of different models. Um, so basically at first, it was just the body, you know, or just a piece, just two boxes. So then we put in the insides. Um, I researched a lot of different types of robots, and it turns out they don't have to have all the wires and stuff. They can just be a model as long as they have some sort of function or something that they have to do. I would show you it, but uh, the marbles, and sometimes they go flying all over the place. I don't <laughs> want to try that. <laughs> they roll out here. I was going to try to add something to that, but yeah, he shakes. And then we had to add the bottom piece back here to make sure he doesn't fall over when he shakes. So I went through a lot of different models, and a lot of research went into him. I even made all my own set of blueprints to show the inside. So talk a little bit about the process, Max. How did you de decide on robots? Well, I really liked engineering, and I thought, why not try to do a little bit of a harder challenge in it? Like, I knew that Colin, uh, uh, one of the fifth grade eight um, people who was doing it, they, they actually did engineering, but they were just focusing on the different types of engineering. So I thought, why not just work on trying to make a robot so I could show basically what it could be used for. And that went through using a lot of different books, using, looking on the internet for different and, like, things which make a robot so it can make, make something that technically you counted as a robot. So once you started developing those passions, why did you decide on a model rather than a presentation or a poster? Well, I did have a presentation that went with it. But I feel like the model showed a lot more, or um, it was a lot more explanatory, so I could just point to something if I needed to use it. I guess you could do that for poster too, but I guess this works a lot better, in my opinion. Does anyone have questions for Max on his model of a robot and all the research that he went into to develop this? So did you use snap circuits for your... Uh, just for the bottom. I made a little thing where he talks a little bit, or more, more like makes random robot sounds. Oh, cool. <laughs> Max, what is it doing? What, what is it supposed to be doing when the marbles fly out? That's where it shakes a little bit, like this. Occasionally, it'll move a little forward. Do you have the marbles with you? Because I would really yep. like to see. Anymore, uh, so then he had to go and, and do the next change. One leg, then it didn't stand up, so we had to put on the bottom piece. <laughs> and then it still fall over then, so I thought I would fix it more up before this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is about 1.17, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's give Max a round. Awesome. change the game of football. So Paul, what was your passion? Uh, I love playing football for the Gladiators. And I thought, you know, it's a great game, but injuries really give it a bad name. So I thought, how could I make the game better and more fun for everybody? So I made an ACL brace for running backs that is smaller and more compact and much easier to use. Because a lot of people don't use um, braces and things to prevent injuries because they think it's going to slow them down or lower their performance. So I tried to make one that would barely cause any effect and be very light for positions that you need to run, like wide receiver and running back. So, um... So why did you choose running back, Paul? Uh, I, it's also used for other positions, but mainly running back, because um, running backs, they are injured a lot, actually the most commonly, and they're most likely hurt by ACL injuries. So I found um, this brace to put on your knee. I created it and I made I made it so it was light, compact, and really easy to slip on. So um, I would have gels, which is just green tape, but it would be gels, that would hold it on and make sure it doesn't fall off. And I also would have something that isn't a sock, 
but it's a sock <laughs> to um, make it so it's you can put put it on and off. Also, ACLs can be turned by uh, hit on the side or turning inward with pressure. So, like if you were going to make a sharp cut or a hit on the side, it would most likely tear. So I would have padding here, and this would hold it from moving. So I also um, it, uh, also I would make it out of um, yeah. I can put it. So Paul originally decided that he wanted to do some research on football. And he said, what can we dig in? How can we dive into maybe solving a problem with, with football? And so we, he really did a lot of research on the most injured position. And then he did some research on the knee. And then he did some research on how to develop a, an efficient, quick brace. And that night, he had lots of people taking a look at this, this prototype. And he is willing to demonstrate how quick he, it works. <laughs> So let's run to the, we'll run to the projector board and back. <laughs> so it was cool to see him come up with a, a prototype that's fully functional. Um, have we tested on the football field yet though? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> but we also thought, what can you do with this for a future career goal? Uh, I thought I could make football a better game for everybody and every running back could want one of these or a wide receiver just to help prevent them from getting hurt and making the game better. We, we talked a lot about how football players make a lot of money. So yeah. how much money could we make with this if we could protect those people that make lots of money? Right? <laughs> um, Do you want to take some questions, Paul? Uh, also, the Badgers use braces. <laughs> but I wanted to make my own because mostly only offensive linemen use braces because they're big and heavy braces. They slow you down, but offensive linemen block, so they're not going to be running across the field and stuff. So... I made one that was smaller and used for positions that include a lot of... <laughs> Paul, it sounds like you have an interest in both playing football and helping the athletes. Which would you prefer, to be the player or to be the helper? The player, but that's very difficult to do. So if I'm not able to achieve that, then this could very much be my career. Excellent. Good for you. <laughs> Outstanding. Let's give Paul a round of applause. The night that we brought in for um, this presentation, this pas passion project presentation, it really felt like a 1990 science fair, except it's the new era. It's the new model of passion projects. And we had a great night. Lots of parents came in showcasing these events. And it really felt like that, that, that clip from um, High Tech High. One other thing that I wanted to quickly showcase, and something that's new at Woodview this year, is the use of Seesaw. And Seesaw is online Facebook for school. However, it's not what you think. It is a, a, a way for our teachers to showcase some learning that's happening in our classroom. And it's really connected to our goal of communication and connecting school and learning to our parents and families. Um, and so this is just a quick glimpse at what Seesaw is. All of our students are using Seesaw. All of our teachers are using Seesaw to really give parents a glimpse of what's happening in the classroom on a daily basis. So this is a weekly report I get on a, every Sunday night. Um, it tells me how many items were posted across our school, how many parents commented on those items, items, how many likes it got, and then also total parent visits to the Seesaw site. So as we thinking, think about impacting parents and getting them uh, a glimpse of what we're learning, this is a perfect opportunity. You can see a couple examples of what could be posted on Seesaw. The first one on the left is actually student work. It's a student that had done a worksheet talking about their pets and then writing a sentence using some of the words they came up with to describe a pet. And then that student took a picture with their iPad and posted it themselves. The one, I guess, um, hiccup that we thought about Seesaw is it seems like a lot of work for a teacher to go around and take all these pictures, but as we've been, been able to work with kids, the kids are posting a lot of the information and then getting that feedback from parents. The other side is we can have teachers that post pictures of presentations and get um, parents a glimpse. So I took a little uh, glimpse of data as well. Um, on what this looks like in our school over the last week since we came, or the last couple weeks since we came back from breaks. So since January 2nd when we came back from, from school, um, from back from break, we've had over 350 items posted um, almost on a weekly basis. Our teachers are posting, our, our students are posting. Um, we're also getting a ton of feedback on a regular basis. 
We have lots of likes, so as you think about Facebook, you can very quickly put a thumbs up on something, but we also have parents providing comments to students that students are getting feedback, not, feedback not only from teachers, but also from their parents. We also want to think a lot about parent engagement. As you can see, the blue line across is basically remained steady since that first week of school when we invited parents to be a part of Seesaw. And we have around 222 parents that are connected to Seesaw on a regular basis connecting to our teachers. And then you can see the red line spiking up and down on the parent visits, maxing out some weeks at over 500 visits to our site. Seesaw is a great opportunity for us to continue to grow and communicate with parents on what's happening in the classroom. And at this point, I've had nothing but positive feedback from parents. I'm really looking forward to extending this learning, not only maybe in our building, but convincing Craig to take it on a little bit too. Questions about Seesaw or passion projects? When do the students actually work on the passion projects? So passion projects is connected to our iTime break block. Right now, um, and because it works really well third through fifth, and we're all doing this common black block, Jen Griffith was available and she did it for 30 minutes twice a week for a six week period. We did one session in the fall and we're gonna do another session in the spring. As we think about our scheduling committee, that one of the things that Diana and Craig and I have talked about, however, is that if you're a student that needs extra intervention or extra support or even enrichment, does that mean you can't have a passion then? because you're seeing a teacher for intervention? So how can we provide an opportunity for all students, whether they need intervention or enrichment, to also have a passion and be a part of the passion project? So that's something that our scheduling team is considering too. Great question. Other questions on Seesaw or passion projects? Is everyone using Seesaw? Yeah, all of our teachers are using Seesaw. We bought a license, our PT $1,500 cost for our school-wide um, Seesaw account, and so every teacher is making at least one post on every student on a weekly basis. Is that every, I know GES does it, is that all schools then? Kennedy? This is like a pilot that, that Mike was trying, and we purchased some additional iPads for title funds to support it, and then we plan on um, moving that forward to Kennedy. One really cool thing that we've seen is students um, having a pretest and taking a video of themselves, taking a look at their pretest and then taking their post-test and showing the growth and talking about their growth through just one quick one minute video that we're seeing students do that and share with parents. So rather than just taking the post-test home and saying this is what I learned or this is what I got right or wrong, we have students talking about it. It's a really cool video. Um, a lot of our fifth graders are doing that. Michael, can I just one Yep. So I have a question about all of, all of the schools. So certain, some teachers in all of the buildings are using it. So even at GS, there are a few pockets of teachers. So we are working growing that. And we are working on a pilot at Kennedy as well right now. Thank you. Thanks for letting me say. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Thanks to our students. Yep. Thank Thanks, you guys. Mr. Deering, is your team, is everyone here? Yeah, I think so, there's a lot back here. Then we will, I see, I see a lot of people, so we'll move you up, and then we'll move to the audit next. Yep, or the next thing you guys can bring, come on up. Thank you, congratulations. Thank you. Nice job, buddy. Okay, so in the interest of accommodating a large group of middle school representatives, we're gonna just go out of order for one item, we're gonna move the uh, John Long Middle School schedule up now so we, they can get in and get out. So I'll give it over to you, Mr. Deering, unless Jeff, you wanna... So Mr. Deering um, has, uh, has had a scheduling team. He'll walk us through that whole piece. Um, he's uh, updated the board at the last curriculum committee meeting. Um, there's been various updates that have been provided and they've come to a, um, a recommendation that they're gonna be sharing tonight with the board to make sure there's no concerns or questions that are still out there. Um, as we look ahead to the 18-19 school year. So he'll walk us through the process and he has a large number of teams standing behind him. <laughs> so good evening everybody, thank you for having us. Um, we have split up the presentation so that you're not just hearing from, from me, so we have various members of our team that will speak. Um, and at the end we'll open it up for questions. Um, so forming the team, coming into uh, my, at the end of my first year at John Long Middle School, we had looked at some concerns that we had with the scheduling and meeting the needs of all students. Um, as far as intervention, enrichment, and those opportunities. And are we utilizing our win time 
um, to the best of the ability and, and capturing that, that opportunity for kids. So um, uh, back last year, 16, 17, I put out a, brought it up in December, got volunteers from uh, our, our staff. I wanted grade level representation, special education representation, related arts, f uh, music, school counselor, um, college and career uh, coach, parents, uh, administrators, so we had, we had a very large team. Um, I reached out to a couple parents that were a part of our PTG or had connection with the PTG in 1617 at that time, uh, which led me to Stacy Ringgold and Tiffany Shantos. Tiffany, you're here, please. She's hiding. She's hiding on us. So the huge thank you to, uh, I put all their names up here because everybody on this team sacrificed a lot, had to go through a lot of tough decision making, tough conversations. So Stacy Ringgold, Tiffany Shantos, Joanne Ward. Nikki Matthews, Sarah Stanislavski, Michelle Chop, Lori Mathias, Jen Juris, Brett Dimmer, Bonnie Brady, Elizabeth Minty, and Doug Art. A huge thank you to that committee. A lot of time put in. So I was forming the team. I'm going to quick review the process, then I'm going to hand it over to let them kind of give details of the process. Uh, from last year to this year, we've had nine team meetings. Uh, we've researched over 15 plus middle schools, their schedules, what's good, what's bad, uh, what are comparables to us have as far as um, periods, blocks, number of related arts based on whether you're block or periods. Um, we narrowed it down to performing site visits at Greendale and Webster Middle Schools. Uh, we, our team ended the process by looking at five different options uh, and narrowed it down to our final recommendation which we're, we'll go through here tonight. Um, and then upcoming we'll still have a presentation uh, to sixth and seventh grade parents, uh, a presentation to them prior to their students going into the scheduling process. Again, their students and parents will also be informed of the options their child has when they bring home to talk about the courses they'd like to take as a seventh and eighth grader. And then as always, we will do an orientation for incoming fifth graders as parents as we do every year. So that will be upcoming. So I'm going to hand it over to Joanne Ward, who is going to talk about priorities and non-negotiables. Um, the first thing we did uh, when we formed the committee is we got together and brainstormed a list of priorities. Well, what would we change in the schedule if we could? And you can see the list on the lap. Um, first and foremost, we wanted intervention and enrichment time for all kids. Um, we wanted to be able to provide intervention and enrichment every day on a regular basis. We talked about having a homeroom sort of organization time, either at the beginning of the day or the end of the day. Um, we valued having common team prep times. And we also were going to try to avoid having blocks back to back without a break for kids. From that list, we then created a list of non-negotiables, things that we just really felt we had to have. And that list is on the right. And that was to have that 30 minute intervention time and enrichment time for all kids. Uh, we absolutely believe that blocks were something we wanted to keep. Um, we also wanted to have Related or uh, related arts course times remain at 42 minutes. So that was our non-negotiable list And then Elizabeth's going to talk to us about the site visits All right, so after pouring over our 15 plus Schedules uh, we decided the two buildings we wanted to visit to see the schedules in action and to talk to principals and teachers were Greendale and Webster and we were able to um, get some valuable takeaways from both from Greendale, we got ideas for making our academic and career planning more consistent, building wide, and how to structure that into our day. Um, we also got ideas for enhancing our literacy practices. We chose to visit Greendale because they had a literacy block at the beginning of the day. We quickly realized that wouldn't work with our block schedules, but they gave us some good ideas for how to integrate that into our longer school blocks so we could still do what we saw that we liked within that structure that our teachers preferred. Um, and our visit to Greendale really did affirm our non-negotiable prioritization of the block. Um, it, Greendale is not on a block, so we weren't able to adopt their physical schedule, but we found quite a few advantages, um, and the teachers we talked to agreed that our structure had some very good advantages. Webster is much more similar to the schedule we ended up recommending. 
Um, their current schedule reflected our priorities, reflected our non-negotiables, and had some excellent ideas for how to structure that universal intervention and enrichment time so that it could be meaningful for all students, whether they required an intervention or not. One of the things we wanted to move away from was in the current WIN structure, there's a block of time where students have more of an unstructured study hall middle school students aren't known for their ability to organize time very well so we wanted to give a little more support and structure to that and they gave us some excellent ideas for that as well as some additional ideas for ACP academic and career planning uh, it makes sense I guess to uh, have me talk about related arts offerings as a choir director and uh, the associate principal of the building so uh, with our non-negotiables <laughs> Uh, remaining with the block schedule in place and core classes not having a reduction in time um, when we when we decided to um, integrate an intervention block school-wide uh, that required us to uh, the reduction of the win period the study hall uh, time um, because of that the band and choir programs are being shifted into the related arts time and you'll see that when we get to our our schedule structure um, so because that moved, now we have an abundance of offerings in related arts classes. And what we saw in the site visits and in the other schools that we um, studied were the fact that with a school our size, we really had a plethora of related arts offerings, probably more than our numbers support fiscally. Um, so with that, um, we've had to make some adjustments to stabilize our FTEs and to uh, still give students a broad array of offerings. So we'll have uh, music offerings. Um, again, band and choir will be during the related arts time blocks, uh, time the, the skinnies we'll call them. Um, sixth grade will have them every day like they do now um, as um, a requirement by state for music classes. Art is required in sixth grade. You'll see that that's still happening and that it's still offered in seventh and eighth grade. Uh, foreign language will still be offered in 7th and 8th grade. Um, tech Ed and STEM were two related arts offerings that really have uh, a similar content. Um, and we, we found no other school that actually offered both of those programs. Uh, so those two programs will be consolidating into one program. Um, and they will, they will remain a STEM program. Um, and then PE and Health will have fewer reductions to... Um, uh, more more closely be related to our student population and to level off class sizes. And now Mr. Dimmer will talk about music offerings. Well, as Doug mentioned, uh, some of the biggest changes in this new schedule come to the related arts areas. Um, as he mentioned, the current setup is that we have two related arts periods per day. Every student has that in addition to a win, where if they choose, they can participate in band and or choir. With the elimination of the win, as Doug mentioned, the band and choir move to the related arts period. So the 200 or so students who have selected about 240 so or so slots, because some of them double, um, they move uh, into the related arts period uh, for taking uh, band and choir. So what does that look like specifically by grade? Again, sixth grade is required to participate in a music class, state requirement. And so they will choose one band, choir, or general music. They cannot participate in multiple uh, ensembles during the school day. The schedule won't allow for that. Um, seventh and eighth grade, depending upon the other related arts classes that they would choose, they can participate in both band and choir. Again, it, it just depends on, on what they choose. Uh, we talk about the doublers. Those are the kids that, that uh, participate in both band and choir. A student can still double, which is again singing in choir and playing in band, if they participate in one of the morning extracurricular ensembles. So if a student participates in choir during the school day, wants to participate in jazz band in the morning, that is uh, uh, definitely an option for them. So kids that are not able to participate in both band and choir during the school day would still have the option by uh, taking part in one of the extracurricular ensembles that, that meet in the morning. Something not changing is the core class time during the day. We had one of our priorities as having the block times. So 6th, 7th, and 8th grade are still having e and ELA in math for 87 minutes every single day as the block. 
and then science and social studies are still having every other day 87 minutes as a black. Um, the sixth grade course, this kind of lays out a little bit for you. Um, for the first period of related arts, they will have PE and health every other day. Um, and then music, that is where they will pick their one elective of either band, choir, or their general music elective. The second hour then, it will be a trimester rotation, so all sixth graders will take this. They'll have art for one trimester, STEM for one trimester, and then digital communications for one trimester. At seventh and eighth grade, they will have a little bit more choice as far as what they uh, get for the related arts classes. So opposite PE, all seventh graders will have one semester of STEM and then one semester of digital communication. So those will be required courses. And then they will get to choose two additional ones between band, choir, art, Spanish, or German. Now at eighth grade, they get a little bit more choice again. If they do choose a, a language, if they choose German or Spanish, that would count as two of their choices. Um, so they'd be left with just one other additional choice. If they don't go with one of the world languages, then they would get three choices because they would be then semester, well, they would be full year classes, but every other day. So. so one of the biggest benefits of this schedule is that we will have our new, as yet, unnamed time that will replace when. Um, and the biggest benefit of that is that we can give that intensive tier three intervention support to any student without having to cost them other opportunities. Currently, if you are a student who struggles in an academic area, you can get support in that academic area or you can get band or choir, you can't do both. Um, and we just, we always feel bad when we have to talk to a student or talk to parents and say, your student really shouldn't be in band or choir right now because they struggle with reading or math. That's a horrible thing to say. That's not what we ever want the choice to be. We want them to be able to do both. So that is um, one of the biggest advantages is that now we'll be able to provide those foundational interventions to all students. Additionally, by having that time at the same time for the whole building, we'll be able to be more targeted and more efficient with what we do during that time. Currently, we offer those interventions stretched across three different times of the day, a sixth grade block, a seventh grade block, and an eighth grade block. So if you are a sixth grader and you have a math struggle, you're lumped together with every other sixth grader who struggles in math. Sixth grade students who are struggling don't always have the same needs. Now we'll be able to have six, eight together, and so we'll have more staff and more resources to offer more targeted interventions that are actually for what the students need. So if we have students who still need very foundational skills, we can have a multi-age group. If we have students who need support with closer to grade level content, we can have a multi-age group. We can have groups that go faster or slower. We can really target that to what we need. Another support that we'll be able to provide that we don't currently provide is a guided study hall option for students who struggle with what we call academic behaviors. Um, that's issues with maybe note taking or work completion, handing things in on time, preparing for tests. Um, right now we're a little scattershot with how we're able to offer that. With this structure, again, we can have teachers who during that time take a small group of kids who need a very structured study hall where they're taught study skills and where the teacher is able to monitor their work completion and the quality with which they're working. And we'll be able to do that within the school day. And then we'll have expanded opportunities again for you know, students who may have social emotional needs or support that we're currently not offering anything for. We could do groups and our student services departments can offer more during this time as well because it's an all hands on deck time for the whole school. Another thing that's come up is uh, some of the comments from special education teachers what about my students uh, who maybe <clears throat> need more of that one-on-one -on -one time we talked about being able to do their specialized instruction instead of having again to pull them from one of their core classes or one of their related arts offerings to do the specialized instruction they can now use this time to do that and then if it's a day where one of those students isn't getting um, specialized instruction they can remain with that teacher and have more support as kind of a guided study hall option to keep them with them to help make sure that they can have that success um, the other kids in the building will be on an enrichment course rotation uh, depending on 
the amount of kids that need specialized intervention. We're looking to have five to six rotations throughout the year, which teachers will develop kind of those fun, extending opportunities for kids. Um, an example is that I've, that I've shared with some people that ideas have come up starting a school newspaper and teaching kids how to do some journalism. A uh, math teacher talked about uh, how to interpret and do statistics, you know, looking at the kind of those fun statistics, whether it's sports or analysis of other things. So those courses will be developed. Um, but one thing that we, we, we've seen going into this is still talking about what about retakes and is there still time to talk to my teacher if I need that time. So that's where Fridays are going to come in during the week during this time which will almost kind of simulate that wind type atmosphere on Fridays. Um, and we'll also use Fridays one time a month to look at our academic career planning and roll that curriculum out um, so that that's a better opportunity to meet that school wide and have all hands on deck with academic career planning. Um, but then you can look at Fridays as that opportunity to do retakes so kids don't have to do it before or after school. They can still get it done on Fridays. Um, they, can, they can meet with teachers to get that extra help. Student council is one of those things that because of all the other activities kids are in, we haven't been able to have a strong student council. Um, our, I know our two advisors are excited that the opportunity of being able to rejuvenate the student council and those leadership opportunities at the middle school, looking at Fridays as well to, to do that. So really excited that the team has made um, a lot of tough decisions. Um, and we understand that with, with everything, if there was a perfect schedule, every, every middle school would have the perfect schedule, but there's not. Um, but we do think that this is going to better meet the needs uh, of our student population to be able to provide those intervention enrichments with, uh, and extend those, that win time of 42 minutes uh, to really make it a productive time for all students. Uh, I'm going to hand it over now to a parent, Stacy, to talk right. about what our new daily schedule would look like. All right, so just to reiterate what everyone had um, just mentioned as a visual, this is what our proposed sample schedule would look like at, like at each grade level. As you can see, the unnamed time, the intervention and enrichment, is across the board um, for all grade levels at the same time. And that's going to be able to target every student, um, whether you're a lower functioning student, a middle of the road student, or a higher achieving student, we're gonna be able to support those students um, at every level. And as you can also see, the blocks, we do not have any more block to back-to-back -back block times, which is currently the back-to-back -back block times are currently happening now. Um, so a student would have three, four, have math, have lunch quickly, and then go to ELA from six, seven, and then eight, nine, have science or social studies. Um, so these are our proposed um, sample schedules for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Questions? Would there be an opportunity if a student, let's say, was in seventh or eighth grade and doing a sport to, instead of doing one, and they do not need any intervention or anything, to have the opportunity instead of one of the elective courses to take six weeks off just to do a regular study hall? Just like during the peak of their season, they're really needing that time just to keep up on. It's something we haven't looked at, but that would be something that we could certainly, if a student starts struggling, could move them into a supported study hall. Uh, that's that that could certainly be an option um, again seeing that but uh, the one thing that we've seen a lot from a lot of our teachers is because of the block schedule they're doing a lot more of their class class work instead of calling home I mean they're doing their work in class uh, but if that were to be something that were to come up I think that's something that we could look at. I have a question um, regarding the enrichment courses you said there would be six week um, courses now the kids who are in those, will they have to take each one? But So they're not options. I just want to... Correct. They will, they will rotate directly through okay. uh, each of those throughout the year. And then in seventh grade, they would go to the next rotation of five to six courses. And in eighth grade, they would have a different... So by the time they get through their middle school experience, they would have had 15 different mini courses um, for growth and opportunities to see different things. That's why, I mean, we really, the intention really is to have kids in the rotation of these enrichment courses. Um, and the, the original intent of the, the guided study hall time was really for those kids that are in, are in pretty serious need. And through, um, you know, through a process of identification by staff, those, those students would be recommended for that. It wouldn't really be at the student's request because I'm busy. That was the original intent. Now that can be revisited, but the, the original intent was if you're not identified by staff, you're in an enrichment course and you're in the track with, with the group getting those experiences. So what changes on Friday? Walk me through that structure again on Fridays. 
that it's more like the wind time before. Um, so Can you go back to the yep. schedule? So the daily schedule would be the exactly schedule? the same, okay. which is okay. what we like because you're not running like a different schedule one day a week. The difference is that during that boom time, instead of being <coughs> in intervention or doing work for that enrichment course, you would go to the same location you went Monday through Thursday, but instead of that teacher having something planned for you, you could get a pass to work with another teacher. You could get a pass to make up a test. You could go to the library. You could go to a club. So it'll be um, a, a system where they check in for attendance purposes, and then they can check out with a pass to do whatever they need. Resource. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our audit report. Um, Go for it. Why is it bummer to get moved down the list? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have to follow all the little kids now, so I don't think it's quite as boring as I would have if I had to follow them. Now, but for you, sir, I did bring extra copies of the audit for anyone who didn't bring the original one I handed out a while back. Twice, <laughs> only twice. <laughs> oh, good luck. Yeah, I saw Chris. And that was many years ago. <laughs> Twelve and nine. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've been here a long time. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So I was asked instead of doing my normal like presentation of what numbers are in there, is just kind of walk you through how this thing works. <laughs> so that you can kind of get a feel for it. So instead, I mean, you can still ask me questions <laughs> if you want to know about the numbers and stuff in there. But I'll just do a quick walkthrough of how this thing kind of flows. So the first two pages, pages one and two, that's our auditor's report. So this is where we put our opinion on the basic financial statements. Um, the one you have is it's an unmodified opinion. So we're saying that the statements are fairly presented. Um, when you move to the next section, it's pages three to 13. That's the management discussion and analysis. This actually isn't prepared by us. It's prepared by the district staff. Um, it summarizes what's in the financial statements, gives information on some of the current events that affected them, and then some factors that could bear on the district's future. Um, we read it, we check the numbers and make sure they match, but it's not prepared by us. It's just required to be in there. <coughs> and as you go forward, pages 14 to 20, these are the basic financial statements. There's actually two different types of statements in there. There's the district-wide statements, and then there's the fund statements. Um, pages 14 and 15 are the district-wide statements. This includes all the activity of the district put together as a whole. Um, they're presented on the accrual basis, which this means is that all of your capital assets of the district are included, so your buildings, your land, your equipment, and then all the long-term liabilities are included, so all your bonds, your pension liabilities, your OPEB liabilities. Um, those are included on those two pages. Um, pages 16 and 18, these are the fund statements. Um, it provides information about the district's different funds. Um, the presentation is by fund, so you'll see that there's a general fund and then there's a big one called non-major funds. These are the smaller ones, and the detail on those is in the back, which I'll get to. Um, these are prepared on the modified accrual basis of accounting, which means the focus is more on what's measurable and available or what's current. Um, they don't include capital assets or long-term liabilities on them. Um, so then pages 17 and 19, these pages provide a reconciliation between the two types of statements. So page 17 is going to reconcile the total fund balance of what's in the funds to the no total net position of the district-wide presentation. So basically it's reconciling your two different balance sheets if you want to think of it that way. Um, page 19 reconciles the activity for, you for the year of the funds to the district-wide activity or basically reconciling the two different income statements. So it'll show you all the differences basically between the current presentation and then the full accrual basis. Um, and then the last one, page 20, presents the statements of the fiduciary fund, so it shows what's in the student activities fund and in the scholarship fund. Um, then as you move on, page 21 to 41, 
these are the footnotes. These contain the required disclosure for the financial statements. So basically it gives you more detailed information on the various aspects that were in those basic financial statements and what makes up some of the numbers in there, like what all your de debt issues are, what kind of fixed assets you have, things like that. Uh, once you get past there, pages 43 to 49, this is what is the required supplementary information. It's pages that are required by GASB to be included. So it's going to give you your um, budgetary comparison schedules for both the general and the special education funds, um, your schedules related to the WRS pension liability, and then your schedules related to the other pensions and OPEB liabilities. Um, the following pages, 51 to 56, is some other supplementary information. Um, so it's additional schedules, some of which are required by DPI, some by other funding sources. Um, this is where you'll have your combining schedules for the non-major funds, so you can see what on there adds together to be in that column on pages 16 and 18. And then there's also a schedule of expenditures of state and uh, expenditures of federal awards. These are required by DPI and the federal grantors so that they see the total that's been given to you by state sources and federal sources. And we use this for the rest of the report, so pages 57 to the end is the grant reporting. Those are there for the federal funding sources and then also for DPI. Um, we put in there what findings we have. This year there were no compliance findings. Um, there were two findings, but they're um, significant deficiencies, so they're financial statement findings. They're basically, we're required to put them in there if we have these items. And they're not uncommon, they're very common for your size. Um, one is that there's not a ideal segregation of duties. You're operating your accounting and reporting function with a limited number of staff. So it's not ideal, but really without hiring more people, there's nothing you can do about it, but we have to include this in there. And then the second being the financial statement statement preparation, that we as your auditors prepare the financial statements and footnote disclosures. Again, very common for your size, but when we do this, we just have to put it in there to make you all aware that we're the ones that are putting that together and then it's being reviewed by the district. Um, we also have a letter, but before I go into that, do you actually have any questions <laughs> on what was in there or how it all works? It's kind of big and bulky, but... There's... I'd say 90 or more. Yeah, I mean, really, to be able to get all the GASB that's always changing, um, all the disclosures that have to be in there, you'd have to be a CPA that's keeping up to date on all the changes that are going on. So it's more common for us to prepare them and then have it be reviewed and okayed by someone on the staff. Right, then we also, if you have it in front of you, I don't, did you give them a letter too? Yeah, here's the We also have a letter slide. that we give every year. Um, the first page, it's, it's gonna be a, basically a duplicate of those two items I just talked about where in this letter we have to say if there's any um, significant deficiencies. So those two items are in there as well. Um, and then we say that there were no material weaknesses, which there's two types of in con internal control deficiencies, a significant deficiency and a material weakness. The material weakness is the larger of the two saying that this could cause a material, um, a material error in, in your financial statements. So we're saying there's none of those. There's just the two significant deficiencies, which I said are very common. Um, and then we also have a couple of other matters. They're not considered deficiencies or weaknesses, just some other things that we come across that we like to make you aware of when we find them. Uh, first being the gift funder fund 21. Um, fund 21 is used to report gifts specified by donors to be used for specific projects or items. It shouldn't be used for collections of fees or admissions. Um, we noted that several transactions are being recorded to fund 21 that actually should be in fund 10 or the general fund. Um, these are related to items of student and athletic fees. Really any fees collected should be going through the general fund and not through one of the other funds. Um, student activity funds are fund 60. Uh, district activity funds are co-curricular activities in which students participate but are administered by the district. Um, district currently has, a, it's called a general or a wash account for each school, which is on fund 60. Um, this includes items that should be recorded in fund 10 as well, such as book replacement or miscellaneous supplies. These should be going through the general fund and not through student activity. Um, and the last two are just informational. GASB 75, um, that's a new one coming out. It's for next year. It's going to require the district to accrue their net unfunded OPEB liability, so it's going to change what you have been seeing for your OPEB liability. Um, I look through here, I might be able to. Fine, but, it is good. but instead of doing that calculation we've been doing where it's basically if you're underfunding each year what the actuary says, you put that difference on, um, it's saying you have to record the full actuarially determined liability. So 
if it was this year, it would have been 2488000 would have been the full liability. So that's just to make you aware when you see a bigger number there next year, that's why they're changing how they're doing it. Um, and on, in order to do that, you're going to need a new actuarial study completed for next year. And then the rest of that letter is all standard items that we have to tell you about. So I'm not going to go through them again every year unless you want me to. <laughs> or if you have any questions for me. Just the, the note A is a supplemental pension relative to the 15000 over five years. Say that again. The supplemental pension plan that we are Fifteen thousand per year for five years. Yes, sure, Pete. Yeah. How is that different than voluntary retirement benefits to teachers who retired prior to March first, two thousand sixteen? Are they somehow different because of the changes they made? What page are you on? On page thirty-six, thirty-seven, and thirty-eight. If in the past those retirement benefits were other OPEB items, and now we just characterize them as supplemental pension funds? Well, the, it actually changed. There was another Gatsby, <laughs> 73. And this, this relates to the supplemental pension. So it required those items to be recorded at their full liability amount this year. Yeah, and the, the other liabilities, so the OPEB amounts, they're required next year. So they had to be split out to implement the one portion of the Gatsby this okay. year. Yeah. Okay. They like to make it confusing okay. and more work. <laughs> that, that makes sense. Okay. Yep. Any questions? Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very Thank much. You Personnel report, we are asking the board to approve um, a fourth grade teacher at Grafton Elementary School with um, the unfortunate passing of Ms. Rulin. Natalie was the student teacher over at Kennedy um, and will be joining the fourth grade team for the rest of the year as that fourth grade teacher. Yep, so uh, this is going to be a continued review of, of what was uh, thoroughly examined at the last finance committee meeting and I've included a memo that outlines some of the expenditure assumptions leading into the 2018-19 <coughs> budget um, including uh, increases in salaries um, projected increases in premium renewals uh, changes in OPEB costs uh, as well as changes, uh, inflationary changes to some of the other areas of the budget. And then along with uh, that would come some assumptions regarding our revenue for 2018-19, uh, which includes uh, a projected decrease in our revenue limit, uh, as well as an increase next year, because we're in the second year of the biennial, this is law, we're expecting to see over $400,000 in our per pupil aid. And so, if we take a look at some of the some of the additional handouts that were in there, um, you'll see the projected budget piece uh, right here, and now it's, it's up on the screen. So we're comparing next year's uh, projected budget to this year's current budget with all those assumptions that are tied into here. In addition, um, as you recall last year, that we did pass a essentially a deficit budget uh, by. Um, levying additional funds into Fund 41. This budget right here that we have displayed puts that back in as if we hadn't done that to have a better comparison of the two budgets. Um, and you'll notice that right now our projected, uh, we have a projected deficit for 2018-19 of over $31,000. And you'll notice a couple other pieces of information down at the bottom. 
we have some non-recurring exemptions that will disappear and fall off next year, um, or that would fall off following 2018-19, um, creating some potential deficits for 2019-20. And uh, I'll move on to the next uh, next page uh, to sort of outline how we how we got there. Um, this is a, using a survival cohort method of projecting our membership. Uh, and as we've mentioned, membership is really the key driver of how much revenue the district has available uh, to fund our operations. Uh, and so we use this in this information in the following sheet, which is our <coughs> revenue projection, which will shortly be uh, coming up on the screen. So what we have here is the, the current year, the current year budget 1718, um, and just quickly reviewing, we had a drop in our three year average because this year's membership of 2009 replaced a larger membership number that was falling off of 2038. So, with that drop of 10 in our three year membership average, our initial calculation ended up about $105,000 less than last year's initial revenue limit calculation. Now in yellow, you'll see the hold harmless brought us back up to that base, that base revenue limit calculation, and then the declining enrollment exemption, which essentially mirrors that, brought us up above last year's base revenue limit calculation, which ended up providing us with an additional $105,000 in our revenue limit. Now moving into next year, we're projecting membership of 2022, which is replacing a membership of 2056. So once again, we'll see a drop in our three-year membership average. So when we take a look at our base from the prior year of 21,300,000, we're gonna fall short of that because that initial calculation taking the 2019 multiplying it by our max revenue per member, which it hasn't changed in a number of years and isn't going to change most likely for a number of years, we end up, we end up about $115,000 short of the prior year. The whole harmless brings us back up to that 21,300,000. Then we get an additional $115,000 declining enrollment exemption. That essentially is trying to make up for the loss of these two exemptions from the prior year. They fall off each year and you start over. So that drop off of 210,000 is being replaced by about 115,000, which ultimately means we're about $94,000, $95,000 below last year's level in terms of our revenue limit. However, outside the revenue limit is that per pupil aid increase. So that significantly aids our budget, even though we're losing uh, around $95,000 in our revenue limit, we're gaining over $400,000 additionally in per pupil aid. Now, what uh, becomes a potential challenge is the following year, in 2019-2020. We, we are projecting a slight drop in our three-year membership average. Now it's important to note then that our initial revenue limit calculation will be a little bit lower than the prior year because we have three less members, so about $31,000 less. However, it's important to note that these two exemptions fall off. That's $231,000. Now this first hold harmless uh, exemption will just bring us back to last year's base. We're still short that 231000 We get an additional $31,000 exemption. That is not going to make up a whole lot of the loss of $230,000, $231,000. That's why for 2019-2020, we're looking at a potential deficit from the prior year of $200,000 in our revenue limit. In addition, because that will be a new biennial, we do not know if there's gonna be an increase in our per, per pupil aid, uh, Mr. Nelson mentioned that it has been discussed, uh, it's been discussed before as well as at the convention uh, that 
you shouldn't necessarily count on there being an increase in that per pupil aid because of challenges potentially in future state budgets. So if we take that information and then we actually head back to that first sheet. Oh, oh, oh sit down. Sorry. Well, this and bingo. Sorry. Yep, there we go. So that's where those that loss of almost two hundred thirty one thousand dollars in non recurring exemptions is listed on here. Potentially we could even be have flat three year membership average, which would mean we wouldn't have any exemptions. Potentially we have a, a deficit for 2019-2020 of upwards of 260,000. With that being said, as we move away from a projected budget into a preliminary budget that will be reviewed in May after we make personnel decisions and finalized in June, we're gonna be looking to budget funds of that amount as much as possible in things that do not necessarily have to be repeated, things like an additional transfer into fund 46 above the 130,000 perhaps an additional levy into fund 41 or money budgeted for uh, new flexible classroom furniture that if those things had to be cut in a future budget we wouldn't be cutting personnel and we wouldn't be cutting programs any questions <clears throat> Correct. So working for this 2018-19 budget, as we start building that preliminary budget, we're going to want to have that dollar amount budgeted into something that could be cut. It doesn't have to repeat so that we aren't immediately cutting into personnel or programming. It can always change, and if you want to shoot down to a, a more colorful page. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yep. So you can see, it's, it's interesting, when you have enrollment, a three-year membership average that's increasing, and that was the last year where we were increasing due to the addition of four-year-old kindergarten, you don't get those exemptions. What you're getting is a larger revenue limit because of this number increasing, and you're, you're multiplying that by that max revenue, so your revenue limit's increasing. Now, if we eventually move to a spot where in fact, our projections would say there's going to be no change in 2020-21. There would be no exemptions because you don't have declining enrollment and your revenue limit calculation is going to be the same as the base from the prior year. So they can actually disappear even if they're not legislated out. But in theory, they could be. But these have been, these have been long-standing pieces of the revenue limit calculation. Uh, and there hasn't really been any talk of doing away with something like that. Questions? Yep. Um, and uh, presenting this kind of uh, points out the, the interesting juggle that goes on with budgeting. Uh, as you recall, uh, Carrie was here presenting the 2016 17 audit. We've just gone over the 2018 19 projected budget, and now we're looking at our current year budget. So we're looking at three different budget years uh, in one sitting. Which is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. um, so this is the first rollout of a budget report we discussed at the Finance Committee meeting. This would be a quarterly report brought to the board. And if you take a look at, um, well, I guess I'll go over it briefly. Um, as I point out in the memo, that 1617 <coughs> fiscal year to date activity is being compared to the, not the budget, from 1617, but the actual spend. So what percentage of salaries were spent by the second quarter of the total spend for the year, not what was budgeted? And then when we look at 1718, you're taking what we spent through December of 
of the 1718 budget and comparing it to the budget. So you can track whether or not you're tracking to be on budget or over budget or about on budget. And so what I've done, and what'll happen each quarter, is uh, some sections will be highlighted that have a variation, and then I'll have notes as I have here below pointing out uh, basically the source or the reason for that variation. And uh, two of them are related to capital object purchases. So we've made purchases in our technology budget, computers and the like, ahead of schedule compared to last year. Last year those purchases were made uh, for the most part later in the year. So you can see those percentage of the total spend is much lower last year than they are this year as we've been able to make those purchases earlier. So there's some variation there and that's the reason for them. Uh, and then I have for all the, the pieces here, um, explanations for each line of the budget as to why there's some variation this year when compared to last year. Are there any questions? on the, the report itself or the information included. Utilities are in purchase services? They are. Correct. They are, however, they're gonna be balanced out because basically uh, those, those costs are replacing costs that would have been coming out of personnel. Now, you're not gonna see that kind of percentage change in personnel because it's such a small portion of a very large budget. So as Topher mentions, this is something that came out of the Finance Committee. We had a lengthy discussion about just providing more information to the board. This is a first um, attempt at doing that in a quarterly way. If there's other information that you'd like or we're looking for input on that, but it's just a way to share more information with the board and, a quarter, and with the public in a quarterly way of where we are with our current budget. Yes, yeah, so, and I'll have Topher walk us through this. This is a situation, though, that um, has been in the news with um, um, land being, um, possibly being annexed into the village um, from the town of Cedarburg. Um, there's a, uh, we've had a couple board members reach out to say, and even community members reach out, to the whole board, as well as myself, asking, you know, why don't we want that land to come into our district? Um, there's a process to follow with that, and so I've asked Topher to research what that process is and to make sure the board is aware of what that is, and we're looking for some direction from the board um, to be able to um, move in that direction or not move in that direction. Right. So we've got some steps, and with the uh, the Colway farm, the, the pending deal would be, um, it would be sold to a developer, and in order to be developed into a subdivision, it would have to be annexed into the village. But uh, as we sort of referenced, that doesn't mean, just because it's annexed by the village of Grafton doesn't mean it becomes part of the Grafton School District. It remains a part of the Cedarburg School District. Um, there is a process uh, by which you can attach a small territory or detach a small territory from one district and put it to another, uh, add it to another. It would be, require approval by both school boards. Um, it would also, so for example, we would need to approve uh, that resolution and then the Cedarburg School District would also have to approve the resolution to detach the territory from their district and attach it to ours. We would also need to invite the electors and the residents uh, to a meeting so that they could uh, have a chance to express their opinion and their thoughts on this matter to the board. And that would also have to happen uh, if Cedarburg were to take up this resolution as well. So. I've presented uh, included information on the process and some of the forms um, and we're, as an administration, looking for direction as to whether or not we would be interested in pursuing this process. Are 
I do not have that information. I'll look for that. Oh, oh Melanie, can you look Homes and duplexes—they're looking at about 190 units. So, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the week. There's no harm on the strippers in investigating this. It's just that it seems really unlikely that it would be successful for the school district in an era of declining enrollment to catch potential students from their, their district. So I mean, we're likely, but you know, it's pretty low. But there's no harm in trying unless it consumes an inordinate amount of time to pursue it. Something that ends up being probably uh, not worth pursuing. So that's what we have to decide. We want to direct these administrators <coughs> to go forward, at least go through this process, because then we can honestly say we tried everything we could to expand our district even though it's likely it's not going to happen. So that's what we have to decide. And I, I believe the deal is somewhat predicated on it being a, current, a Cedarburg School District property. And so it, it's possible that we would invite people who might have to voice opposition uh, to this process as well, as it would uh, endanger the potential deal. But in the end, the process can't be adversarial. It's got to be neutral. So, so we can't go down the process and draft a resolution and see where on the other side say, sorry, we're not interested. It can't be adversarial. So maybe what would be the harm in reaching out? At least at, either at the board level or at the administration level to find out the interest. I mean, they're exploring referendum. Or they are. It's, it's true. Addition. I read. seems like I read things about them. Does that impact their decision in any way? So would less students help them not have to further develop other things? Yeah, we don't know. It seems like there's space issues. I read things, but yeah, it's a good question. And in the end, this does run into the boundary of our Western edge. Yes. Because it's going to be a little bit more expensive. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, okay. one, more, one more lot over, it is, it is craft and school district. Mm -hmm. So if, if that land were to continue to be developed, moving to the east, then that is our district line. Um, is there also, uh, you know, whether this development or future developments leverage is applied to uh, community leaders? Yeah, so right up here, the in red is the Kelly Farm. Um, and so that is Cedarwood School District. But over here is the Rapid School District. And in the end, we're, not, we're always in competition with our neighbors. And our goal is to be Everybody's good and surpass them in terms of this. So, so why? Well, it's, it's the village of Grafton, but it's the Cedarburg School District. It's been a moniker that's been selling real estate for years. Our goal is to change that. Um, you know, so we should be, we should be, I believe we should be reaching out to them. We should be talking to our own civic leaders to, to get their people on this as well. And, and there's a lot going on. But because the process can't be adversarial, it's, it's a matter of, is there any interest on there? If there is no interest, um, and they're not willing at all back in the city of Lake School Board to discuss this, uh, and make our preference known, well, that's my opinion. We'll make our preference. Mm -hmm. I've heard a couple of times that this development is predicated on it being seen in school district. Does that mean that this developer is not going to build this, this, this development if it gets uh, put into our district? We don't know that necessarily. We just we know that that's kind of the purchase of the land is somewhat set on that. They would have to make a determination following that. I would imagine the owners, if they have a deal set up, might voice concern over that deal not happening for them. It's just something we have to be, I, I think, open for. It's, it's currently Cedarburg School District. The land is currently Cedarburg School District, town of Cedarburg. So. They, they like the idea of the annexing because then they can have sewer and utilities coming that way. And But that would be a change of the, the district, and that's what we don't know. What, what, how the developer would respond, that's not really our issue. It, it appears the developer does very much so. That's correct. That's correct. 
So we would equally like the residential base. We, we we can definitely yeah we, that's what we need I mean it's it's quite a process and we're we're good with doing the process um, but but you know we could also reach out I mean maybe Terry and I together can reach out it's a board decision on our end it's also a board decision on their end so that's why we haven't really reached out to administration because it isn't really administration's decision to make that yes or no um, the board would be making that decision we could obviously reach out to the board president and Cedarburg and have that discussion and, and if the board would like them. Ratios that have to be met. Are they a function of When you say the ratios that need to be met. Well, uh, 117.131, the assessed value of territory taken transfer divided by its assessment ratio. Is that as it exists today, undeveloped, or is that as it exists? My, under my understanding is it would be as developed. Uh, it's currently existing. As it's currently yeah. existing, not as developed. Which, as it currently exists, this would be an issue for us. Correct. As it's ultimately developed, it could be an issue. Yes. That's taking an established neighborhood uh, is, a, is a definitely a different game. I guess I don't know history, so how did it, was it Coit Road and then the pieces mm -hmm. that are already in there, mm -hmm. that end up where we end up? Because Right, and it, it sort of does that with all of our communities because there's some town of Cedarburg that would be Grafton School District. There's some Sockville that would be in the Grafton. I mean, it's vice versa. I mean, depending on how it's laid out, um, what the history is, we we wouldn't know that. Yeah, but it it, it is odd, and it happens. It is, it is odd. Um, is it odd because at the time the board didn't pursue, or maybe they did pursue, and that other board said someone's right. not interested? Right, I, I've seen that. I've seen that where a, an established community, a, a neighborhood, has asked to be moved into a different district, and the district that would be losing those families had said no. That was established families. You already right. knew how many kids you'd be losing. You right. could, you know, use Google Maps to say Look, that that's this many kids that equals this, um, we're in declining enrollment. I've seen that where then you haven't had both parties agreeing. But to have it be new before it's even developed and we don't know how long that would be, what's the build out, how long would it take for a full build out, you know, those are questions that aren't answered. So from a tax point of view, if it is and it's, they pay their property taxes to the village of Grafton, but we get no, all the students are helping, well not helping, but you would see increased enrollment in Cedarburg schools. Yeah. And the village would pay a portion of those taxes to Cedarburg, like they do now. They have some parts of the Cedarburg school district, and so part of that that tax uh, income coming in is sent to uh, Cedarburg school district presently. So the village is going to, because my thought would be this deal is probably a lot less likely to be a lot less attractive if the village didn't annex it, right? Because they want sewer. Right. It, this kind of development wouldn't be possible unless it's annexed by the village. It couldn't be annexed, I assume, because it's town of Cedarburg. It's probably not the village or the city of Cedarburg is not able to annex that. So well, they, I believe it has something to do with with because of where it's at being bordered and, and where you are there. Yeah. Right. So it, it would almost seem. My guess would be that it. Assumed it would be Cedarburg School District because it is, but the likelihood of the attractiveness or the viability, maybe even of the whole project, goes away if the grafting doesn't mean it's that. Correct. that it would be, be, it would be different. I mean, if that's our, yeah. If our relationship with the village is maybe in an ideal world, we could work with the village and say, exactly. "We don't. We want this. Right. It's not happening if you don't." Manage. Go. Because I can't, to your point here, I mean, why would the senior school board say, sure, go ahead? And I just can't. Not that that phone call shouldn't be made, but my guess is that's a really, really short phone call. I mean, I'm thinking if it was the other way around, and they came to us and said, do you want to take this? And then, yeah, we'll discuss it. Well, we need some direction if everyone feels like we should at least have some preliminary discussions. Jeff and I can talk with Derek, uh, the board administration, we can talk with the village and see what their thoughts are at this point.
there is no rush, right? It's not like you're in a deadline for which you do it right away, not just mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, we've had, as I said, we've had community members reach out to us asking. Uh, we wanted to bring it in front of the board um, to ha here, have that discussion, let you know the work that we've done behind the scenes, but uh, next steps could be. So we'll. I'm Where are they at with the village actually annexing? Uh, it's it's not annexed yet. So basically, I think there's, they still have the, the deal going down. I'm not sure of when the date would be where the village would, would actually annex that. Because it seemed like that would. Yeah, once that happens, it seems like whatever odds we have, the more soon they are, we go even smaller. Perhaps. We'll get on there. Yep. 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 Any other questions about that? So the Joint Review Board member to designate essentially the old I mean, we talked about that before. They are convening the Joint Review Board, and they're convening it fairly quickly, right, in March? Yep, they've asked for a date in March. Um, we got an email on Friday, and then we got a follow-up response today that they're trying to get um, someone from the district to represent um, the district. And so we had it as an agenda item for the board to be able to um, either choose a member or designate administration, whatever the board would like, to be able to represent the district um, on this review board. We discussed what that means at the last meeting, and um, so I asked people to just decide if they had any interest. They did have one board member express interest, and I'm inclined to, uh, it was Jerry, I'm inclined to appoint him unless anyone else feels like, oh, shoot, I missed the vote, I really want to do that. We can talk about talk about that, but if anyone's got any objections, I'm happy to do that. If anyone's got other interest, talk about it. And also the joint review board for purposes of discussing TIF associated with the commercial on the east side. That's correct. Um, which has some challenges. So, so I'd like to get a little bit on that, but I think uh, what is the interest of the board relative to that level? Yeah, just a lot of higher? No, so it's... it's it's, it's, e it's east of Juices, goes down there and freeway, and it's, it's farmland now. Um, right, yeah. It's an interesting a little north question, north and east of Colders. We've taken an official position. We had this in the past, or our unofficial position was we wouldn't stand in the way of this progress. Um, but someone has some thoughts on what if Jerry's arm would start. Mm -hmm. Not on the table, kind of thing, and you can talk about that. Well, I'm not a huge fan of it, but living out in the town, it probably personally affects me if it becomes light industrial. Um, it obviously is a high, I mean, right now it's farmland, which is adding, it could eventually be residential, which in the town plan obviously is more desirable for the school district because that's become a residential development, bringing in new families versus industrial, which doesn't bring in. I mean, new business is great for the village. It's not great for bringing in increased enrollment in the school. It's an interesting point. I don't know that we, this committee is not charged with that kind of decision making. And so I'm, it's a great point. I don't know if that comes into your discussion because really that committee can be just the answer to one four question. And I, and I don't know that that but I think in, it's, but it's a good point. I would say that it is valuable. Like, that's some nice real estate out there. Like, but for, I don't know if it does need it, that no one would develop it unless given the tax incentive. Because a residential development does not need to be annexed into the village because you can build it with all the other townhomes you're built with, you know, not needing. Store and the yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the buff four for me gets really difficult when the developers quote it as saying this property is head and shoulders above the rest. And then why do we tip? That seems to be completely counter to the reason. Yeah. Or they just know that we're going to get it anyway. So they'll tell you we absolutely love this property. It's perfect for what we need. 
in any other negotiation. Oh, you can pay for your own. Yeah, when I saw that as well, I thought the same thing. How do you put that in? Right. Oh, seven children. Oh, the other side is, it's odd because it's so diametrically opposed to the colon. We've had all this significant commercial development in retail, the hospital, all great development for the village, and we continue to see the decline in growth. So, so does this commercial development change that? We're bringing in light industry and we're, we're, we're bringing in jobs that sustain, but it wasn't all the other development meant to be that. <coughs> and we were talking about a residential development that's 190 units. But we have to fight tooth and nail to ensure that we'll try to get a process that will allow that to be within the district boundary. And here, the TIF is established. The commercial development that historically hasn't led to increase in growth. It's a challenge. Uh, that's that would be my perspective. I'd be hard pressed to say that but for. Of course, that becomes a push comes to shove discussion that then they say, okay, we walk away from the table, and that's always a risk. But uh, I, I agree with you both that, uh, that, that you can go into that meeting with both of those points and make a valid point. Okay, we'll wait to hear when that meeting is over. Fifth grade, fifth grade placement. So at, at our November board meeting, we had um, a lengthy discussion about um, the, um, the idea of making, should, should we be making an exception for students um, looking ahead to as we redistrict? Um, what does that look like and so forth and so um, the board had settled on the idea of looking of having a discussion about um, current fourth graders going into fifth grade and because of the number of students that would be affected in that that there's smaller numbers of students um, that may not be um, leaving with as, as many or being going to a building that would um, have as many friends that would be there so for example there would be two students going to Woodview. And so we had a lengthy discussion about well, what does that look like it's about class sizes. The board had then directed us to um, do a survey to two parents. Um, so we sent um, a survey to parents. There's 25, 25 students that were affected by this. Six were assigned to Kennedy. 19 were affected um, that were assigned to Woodview. Um, and at that point, um, I believe our numbers were 62 and 62 is what we were so you know our cons you know we, we said well if 19 kids were to say I don't want to be a would be I want to be at Kennedy what would that do with class sizes and we didn't know so we did the survey so um, Kara developed a survey um, and then she sent out the email on 12 7 12 22 and 1 8 to all of those families we had a total of um, 14 responses out of the 25 uh, nine of the 14 said they were okay with their placement two requests were made to stay at Woodview two requests were made to stay at Kennedy, and one was um, a request to go to Kennedy instead of Woodview. Um, and so um, looking at that, um, we really you have, you have basically a, a, a difference of one in that way. Um, the numbers have switched a little because we've had some different assignments with other for other reasons and people moving and so forth. So if we were to grant those five people um, if the board were to grant the, the, those for those five families that exception for that one year so their kid their child is going into fifth grade it isn't for siblings they would have to provide their own transportation all those things that the board um, explained we asked that in the survey they had to check saying they knew that um, it would bring our numbers to 64 at Kennedy and 60 at Woodview so in a three section school you're at 20 at Woodview you're at 21 21 and 22 um, for the the feeling of, of those families and their um, their concerns with their kids and being able to end that elementary school um, at that school, I, our recommendation would be to accept that. But the board has has asked us to look into it. Those are the data that we have. We did not hear from those other 11 families, um, but three attempts were made to get a response, and um, the majority of them were fine. They were okay with the placement, and five were not. You said just 64 to 61? It would. It'd be, it now changed even since even since my update on Friday. It would change from 64 to 60. I would say, I'm sorry, 
follow up with those other five families as well I'm listing them as that and um, yeah we believe I mean you know obviously this was a, a hot topic in the community it was um, spoken about with parent groups us reaching out three different times both immediately after the board meeting before break after break um, you know I, those are emails they're emails what you sent out though is considered to be a survey, correct? Yes, sir. So would something have to have a formal document, or some kind of a formal document for them to fill out to say, you took the survey, we would implement this, fill this out, send it this, and then it receives it online. For the five? For the five or oh, for, for the all, five? Or for all of them. Because um, I mean, some people want to see survey and they just maybe not chose not to fill the survey out. Yeah, well, we had we had a description. The description was pretty um, lengthy, lengthy but explicit on what um, what, what Carrie took the Carrie took the survey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she might have been the first one actually. For the board, the board has directed us to do this. We had a we had a description that went with that, um, so that they would know this wasn't just a random survey. This is an opportunity to do that. Um, to fill that information out. What's the point for the five families who did decide to either stay, you know, to stay in Kennedy, to stay in Woodview, and the one who's supposed to go to Woodview going to Kennedy? Yep. Do we need them to sign something? Because part of that on the email or that survey said that you understand that we're not providing transportation right. to that, you know, to your school. You would be on your own to get your child to, if you're staying at Woodview, we are not, you know, going to come get you. And we, we can do that. I mean, I, I spoke with one of the parents today who had called saying, you know, do I need to come to the open session tonight and make a comment? And I said, well, you're obviously welcome to. Here's the data that it is. Um, I don't know what the board will do, but here's what the data is. And, and so that person understood the whole transportation piece. Um, um, but we, we could we could do that. We could follow up with them and say we'd like you to, um, whether it's an electronic signature or whether it's a, a paper signature. Um, but we, we our, our goal would be to follow up with them with a letter saying the board has 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 made the decision to to approve the one year exception exception that you've requested and you will now be going to the school we would allow then we let the principals know um, for that so that there's a clear path mm -hmm. in case for some reason yep. something changes and then suddenly in september it's like what do you mean sure. you know i thought i was getting this sure no. yep and we can include that in the letter and reiterate those pieces um, that would go with it Okay. Okay. So we will move on that. Um, so as we look ahead to the 18-19 school year, we want to be able to share with our families um, what our school year looks like next year. You know, this year is a unique year in that we started school earlier. We are uh, have had a lot of different times off than other districts um, in our area because of our construction schedule will be ending early um, and so forth. So um, we started looking at this back in gosh, probably November, as an administrative team, um, looking at um, what, what the school calendar could look like for the 18-19 school year. We've researched some other districts um, in our area, across southeastern Wisconsin. Um, there's, a, there's a push right now in CESA 1 to look at trying to have um, uh, schools all have the same spring break um, and sort of have like a standardized um, spring break. So there'll be more information you'll hear about that. Um, we try locally to, um, to work together with Port, um, Cedarburg, um, Mequon, Northern Ozaki, um, all the Ozaki County schools. We have a discussion about trying to keep our spring breaks similar um, in our area. Um, but the, the, the push is to have something in the last week of March, um, no matter what, and then, um, and then have something around Easter, whether it's that, that Good Friday and the Monday after or whatever it may be. So there's some <laughs> schools that are um, um, more west of us, um, the Arrowhead, Kettle Moraine, Pewaukee. Um, that, are, that have looked at that, even some um, schools as you had um, south, um, Nicolet, Shorewood, and so forth, that have looked at that. 
um, Ozaki County, we've not looked at that. We haven't we haven't researched. We haven't looked into that. We've been looking at keeping a, a break similar to um, around that that traditional Easter um, timeline. So um, that's something just as a background information for it. Um, as we started looking at this and researching what other districts were doing, um, we did come across. Um, two districts, both Kettle Moraine and Pewaukee School District, um, is, and then the Elmbrook School District is moving to that. I just spoke with their superintendent um, at the convention last week, um, where they they have elementary students start school later than their others than, than the rest of their um, than the rest of their student bodies, and they call it Great Starts Conferences. And what they do is they they set aside 45 minutes for conferences for families and students to come in and have an individual meeting with each teacher. So. I have 21 students, if I have 25 students, whatever, however many students I have, instead of having my sneak peek the week before school starts, first day kids come in, they sort of get going, and then I meet you at that sneak peek for, for two minutes, five minutes, whatever it may be, and then I see you at parent-teacher conferences. Um, they don't have that sneak peek. They have where you're coming in for those couple days where as school begins and getting a, an opportunity to um, express your um, strengths of your child, some of your concerns you may have, the excitement you may have, um, as well as the teacher has an opportunity to do some, some testing, whether it's F&P testing, maybe about 15 minutes of that. Um, and so it helps that teacher really get to know in depth that student and that family, as well as helps that student feel very comfortable um, moving into uh, that, that different grade and that teacher. Um, as we look at our year, um, and the transition, you know, a lot of the concerns I hear are, as you move from three elementary schools to two elementary schools, um, are they really going to know my child? How are we transitioning? You know, and we've said that just as we do now, we'll still be having teachers get together with principals and have discussions about who should be with who and, and who shouldn't be with who and how, what their learning styles are and all those pieces. Um, we have time set aside to do that, but this would be a, an idea as we are looking at things, this might be a good year for us to pilot something like that. Um, whereby we would look to have um, the first three days of school, so that Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday be a time where we would have um, elementary students not start school to their first day of school would be on that Friday, but to have a, a great starts conference with their teacher. With their, um, we do that currently now with our EC and 4K, um, where they come in and they do that. Um, and it's, it's, it's um, been met with great success. Uh, one of the teachers that came from one of those districts had brought that with her um, when she came. Um, on Friday, so that, that was our, our thought process. A concern that we had was, you know, when will teachers be able to move into their classrooms? When can they get their classrooms even ready as we look at our construction schedule? Um, you know, jumping ahead a little on the agenda, on Friday we met with Hoffman for three hours to talk about um, our entire administrative team, talking about what does the end of the year look like? What does the beginning of the year look like? Packing, moving, storage, all those pieces. When do we need to be out? When does abatement occur? All those different pieces. And um, for new spaces, um, they are saying um, that probably around the 20th of August is when we may be able to get into new spaces. Um, for remodeled spaces, they are saying um, the 27th of August, um, which is a week before school begins, will be the first time that teachers will be able to get into their room. So you think of um, all of our teachers, but um, we'll, you know, we'll be impacted in a certain way. Science at the high school will be significantly impacted. Other, other rooms won't be as impacted at the high school. The middle school will have some construction occurring over the summer, but it won't be anything major. Um, the elementary schools, almost every room, meaning with Hoffman, is going to need to be packed up and either moved into a different part of that building or moved into a, a semi um, a storage unit um, for that. So um, starting on the 27th will be an opportunity for them to be able to unpack all those boxes, get things on the wall, and get things ready for school to begin. So um, following that meeting, it really reaffirmed the idea that this is a great year to do a pilot. We have people that are concerned about um, making those connections with their teacher, being able to share in a face-to-face -face meeting before school even begins the opportunity to do that. Um, we met with, um, we have an elementary scheduling team that um, is currently meeting. I went and talked to them about that idea. There's teachers on that team. There's parents um, from each of the different schools that are on that team. Um, I, Topher and I met with uh, um, union leadership. They shared it with their, their board um, and really predominantly positive comments from, from both groups about that, um, but about the idea of starting the year in a different way this year um, that would help us with that. The back, the back page sort of talks about the hours calculation. Um, so it used to be numbers of days um, at secondary level and hours, and now it's just hours. And you can see that at the high school level, 1137 hours are required, and at the middle school, 1137 hours are required, but at the elementary school, uh, 1050 hours are required. 
437 for 4K because it's half day um, that would go with that. So even with us starting elementary later, there are still we still have an excess of 85 hours um, for our elementary students. So we aren't at risk of not having enough instructional hours for our students. Um, we see that idea of being the opportunity to get the year off to a great start, surpassing the the. The, the, the loss of instructional days um, because we believe that that will help us start the ground running with our with our students um, helping them feel comfortable helping staff feel comfortable um, working with the staff we talked about um, if the board were to approve this um, we would develop um, a calendar that would um, for parents to sign up on and we'd vary those hours so maybe one day is you know eight to three one day is ten to five and one day is twelve to seven um, so there'd be so we'd be able to those stay-at-home parents as well as a working parent to be able to go ahead and do that if those days don't work the expectation would be um, that the teachers follow up and set up a time with those families to be able to do that um, so so that's that's probably the biggest idea that we're sort of looking at um, as um, as a change um, in our schedule um, we're, we're doing the high school last year had piloted you know in the past they did ninth grade only for a whole day and they had 10th through 12th grade come the next day with our construction schedule we needed more instructional hours so they piloted ninth grade only in the morning and everyone coming in that afternoon they really like that so they're staying with that the middle school still really uh, enjoys the sixth grade only a great transition time with only sixth graders their link crew web crew, web crew thank you web crew run some really great um, activities for kids they're sticking with that and then seventh and eighth graders would start on the fifth um, so that's probably one of the the, the biggest differences with this with this calendar um, that we are looking at um, once again we are starting our new teacher orientation on that the 22nd and 23rd so the, the Thursday or the Wednesday and Thursday um, this year we use canvas which is our learning management system to create some online stuff for new teachers so acclimating them to our school system as well as helping them see the benefits of an online system and doing that with possibly their students um, um, using it in that way we'd still have our teacher professional development during those first four days um, obviously um, you know the, those uh, our, our PD will be affected by the fact that you know teachers are basically coming into their classroom on that 27th and school starting on the 4th for a number of staff so for some it'd be on the 5th for some it'll be on the 7th but the amount of time it will take for them to be in their classrooms it won't be a typical year of PD um, um, in, as we get ready for the beginning of school um, and then we looked at we, we used to have a day off in September we moved that to the October day for professional development so on the right hand side so underneath each of the things in the calendar it'll say no school teacher professional development day and on the right side it'll give you the number of days that are um, set aside either whether it's in the trimester or whether it's in a quarter as well as what exactly those days are for professional development whether it's district whether it's grading um, whether it's building whatever it may be there um, that would go with that um, you can see November end of first quarter we um, so we have the ninth um, as a professional development day Thanksgiving break is the 21st to the 23rd there's an early release for 5k through 8 as we finish the trimester there um, and then we have no school on um, winter break would start on the 24th we'd come back to school on the 2nd of January semester would end on the 24th so it'd be a, a PD on the 25th of January um, February there is a early release um, day for um, 5k through 8 and then um, professional development day on the 22nd um, March would be parent teacher conferences you can see that at the end of the third quarter then uh, end of the trimester on the 8th and the third quarter on the 12th um, the 15th would be professional development to be conferences in the morning and then it'd be professional development um, and um, um, collaboration and then vertical building PD that afternoon um, spring break would be um, leading up to Easter Easter is on the 21st um, next year so it'd be the 15th um, 15th to the 19th um, we have no school Memorial Day and then we would be um, the last student day would be on June 7th and then teachers would come back on the 10th and the 11th the 10th would be um, a building slash grading day and the 11th would be professional development So questions? I had a question on the hours. Um, so the goal is for next year we're going to two elementary schools that all the schools will have the same, not all elementary schools will have the same number of hours, correct? Because like this year I just found out that Kennedy 
gets released earlier than Grafton Elementary School and Woodfield. So in theory, they're getting a few less minutes each day. Released like on a normal day? Yeah. What time do, does Kennedy get out? It's a 220 dismissal. We do prepare the for dismissal with some busing and getting ready for the, for the end of the day before the 220 bell rings at the 320 dismissal bell. I've never heard, I, I'll be honest, I've, I've, not, I've not heard that. Okay. But, so yes, our expectation would be that we have the similar, the same, because we're basing our, our time off of that, that we're turning into DPI. It's not really a concern because we have so many extra instructional hours, but no one, yeah, no one's, I, I, we can look into that if you'd like, but no one's ever said that to me. I think the idea of elementary schools is a great year to do it. <laughs> so we've reached out to the Y. Michael's reached out to the Y for us to talk about being able to provide Y care because we do know that this will be for working families. This is a, a, a more days that they may and they may not even have an opportunity if you have a high school kid who's been your babysitter to be able to help out with that. Um, so we understand that. Um, and that's when the one concern that both Kettle Moraine and Pewaukee both said, you know, that, that uh, that's the one drawback. Um, hopefully by being able to communicate now um, for a September timeline that would uh, allow people to do that. I know we did that this year with ending school early, um, you know, is a, is a concern also. Um, but that's something that we're working with the Y to be able to provide care um, and to be able to have an option for parents that may need that option. So the January, it works well for the grading period. I know some parents had asked about the Martin Luther King Day, you know, like mm -hmm. Martin Luther King Day is Monday and then we get off on the Friday following, Mark, like this year is before Martin Luther King Day and then like next year will be the Friday after Martin Luther King Day with some parents or other things being able to celebrate Martin Luther King Day on that Monday. But it does fall, I noticed, like perfectly with our grading. It does give teachers time to grade. So is that the reason behind not giving the holiday on the 15th day. Um, what is MLK? I'm trying to look up what that is for 19. 21st. Um, I mean, um, the, the days are such that we, we could bring it back. Um, we, we could have the 18th be the final day of the semester and the 21st could be a grading day. Um, you would have no school. Um, teachers would still be here grading, um, but you could, have, you could have no school on that day. Um, I just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's solvable. No, it's not a bad thought. I mean, we, we're one of the few I districts, there's like three of us in this area um, that, that had school on that day because that was also, it, it looked like it was going to snow. Um, so we had to, uh, as a superintendent group, get together and just discuss what does that look like and with right way and so forth. And it ended up not being um, inclement, as inclement weather as it's supposed to be. But, um, that is something that we could do that, you know, the days are never matching up perfectly anyways for secondary. You know, it's 90 and 87, so it just makes second semester a couple days longer. Um, but it wouldn't be a, it, it's not a, it's not a major issue um, in that way. But does that then carry over year after year after year? Is there ever a time where it will become an issue? It could and I'm, I just noticed like this past year we had off Friday and then Martin Luther King Day was on Monday so in my head I was thinking like I wonder why we didn't just go one more day and then take the holiday on the Monday this past year and now this year upcoming year the difference of four days it's only because some parents have off and I was thinking okay you have Monday off and then your kids have like the Friday before or after you just had the day off so it's a challenge it's always nice if the kids have the same day off you have one i understand the teachers still have to work regardless they were did on february when president's day we're on that friday but president's day is on that monday and a lot of people have presidents and parents i think that's it but i do like the days off Preferably right after you know trimester or quarter end, because that is the ideal time for right. teachers to be great. I would personally be opposed to taking a 
Monday the 21st off have to be canceled because it's convenient in our schedule, have always been in favor of having Martin Luther King Day off. Um, that's never got a lot of traction around here. Like I said, we're one of the few that, that don't take it off. I would rather make the statement that we're honoring the memory and, and make that a every year thing, but I would I think we'd keep it if we did it if it was a just personal like the boss point. So if we're, we're going to have that discussion, I'd be in favor of having discussions with that that's the part of our calendar. To encourage our students to do a day of service. I mean, you know, to maybe engage mm -hmm. in that. There's, there's, yeah, I mean, well, I think there's two sides to that argument. Is like one is should we make a bigger push for our staff to do something that honors Martin Luther King that occurs during that day, or do we say, well, we're going to expect that parents are going to do that, and some parents work, some parents don't, you know, whatever it may be, and the kids, you know, some will choose to do it, some won't. I mean, there's there's totally pluses and minuses to both. Uh, we don't want to be seen as is not wanting to support that mem his memory, the tradition. Um, that we want to continue to um, pro progress forward in. Um, um, why didn't we do it last year? Probably because as you look at the calendar, there's eight, there's a ton of different things to look at, and that's why we bring it to you to hear one more. You know, that's no one asked that question last year. Terry did after it was over. I remember that um, distinctly, um, having that discussion. Um, and, um, but, and at the end of the day, we're not neither. Advocating for, for making an observation that the kids could be off that day. It wouldn't be a holiday because teachers would still right. 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 Or yeah. as, as long as school starts on the 4th, it's probably always going to be close. You know, if school starts earlier than the 4th, then that's probably where, um, th then that's where it probably becomes a harder issue to say that's when your semester break is going to be off. Or you, you say, yeah, we're going to take that day off and we don't take a different day off, or kids come back on Monday. I mean, one of the things that we want to do is, we've heard loud and clear, people like getting out earlier in the summer. So one of the, the negotiables that we had as, a, as an administrative team was trying to get out on the 7th have students be done by June 7th. Um, but uh, the more days you take off, um, at the high school there's eight hours. Now we haven't had a snow day, you know, you know in a while around here, maybe cold day years ago. Um, but you know, you don't want to have one day and then be having to make up time. Um, we've talked about if we had a snow day, there are some things we could do with the late start um, and maybe even an exam schedule second semester that would gain us a couple hours pretty easily. Um, so we wouldn't have to use a PD day or try and do something like that. Um, they'd be superficial, but um, we, so we, we are we're building in time so that if there's there's bad weather, it, it wouldn't cause us to be under our hours. Um, but we did work backwards, saying, okay, well, we got once we got to that point, we're like, well, June seventh, but you could easily in this calendar or any other, as long as we're starting school in September, it's probably going to be really close to semester. Ending. So, so would you like us to make that change? As a board? Is there a way to project forward the constructs of this schedule? That desire to get out roughly around that June 4th, or June 7th, <coughs> and an assumption that we start the day after uh, Labor Day and take a look at the next three or four years to determine well, what is the impact on saying that that grading period? January is going to end the Friday before mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. just, just to make sure that at the end of the day we're not mm -hmm. shortchanging by number of days one of the grading periods and making it extraordinarily long. It seems to be able to roll that forward. Mm -hmm. Sure, totally. Without having a great deal of detail or specificity to any other day. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and I'd rather we do it planned for as opposed to, well, this year it works, next year it doesn't work. Right. Mm-hmm. Look at that. Mm-hmm. Look at that. Mm-hmm. Sure. Maybe yeah, we can do it. But if you're, if it, if we don't have another board meeting for a month, if we're delaying the calendar by a month, with this question. 
Well, only yes. yes you're by a month, I mean, is that is that the end of the world? I, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't. I, 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 that, that'd be for you to decide um, whether that's is this the pressing issue asking about. I mean, I think people want to know. My understanding is that people want to know: Are we starting school early? And that that you know, are we starting school late? Excuse me, not early. Are we starting school late? Um, seems to be people's concern, and we've had zero discussions with Hoffman. That is just a non-negotiable that we're starting school on the fourth. Um, so, so you could look into that I very easily. As it relates to August twenty-seventh. That is exactly what it means. Okay. And I've expressed that. I expressed that to the union. Didn't I? Um, and, and I think everybody has to appreciate this is. This is a unique year. This is a unique year. Um, you know, will we still have our all staff welcome back? Definitely. Will we still do that? Will we still recognize years of service? Will we still do celebrations together? Yes, we will. Um, but it was a unique year this year um, on, in various areas, and we've built in time. You know, we have time built in for our calendar from now until the end of the year for opportunities like packing that is unusual. You don't usually think of professional development as packing your classroom, but we've set aside time in April for staff to be able to have time to do that. So we're, we're you know, we want the board as well as teachers as well as our community and families to know that we are aware of the things that occur. And although we, we want all students to be as successful as possible and having teachers collaborate is one of the best ways student achievement we also realize there's also some nuts and bolts that need to occur that also help teachers be in a spot where they can collaborate they can be successful in their classrooms um, that would go with them and you know with Hoffman telling us on Friday you know that's something that we that's helpful for us to know because in the past you know you're in your classroom coming over summer that's gonna be a totally different thing um, different than it's ever been if we wouldn't have had the challenges with the with Hawkins going to get in this year, when would have been the earliest we could have started classes this year? Um, the fourth. The fourth is the earliest you can start unless you have that waiver from DPI because you have a construction project or something like that or your poor performing school district. Okay. Um, those are really the, the main things as to why you can start earlier. Um, you know, that's the, the tourism block sort of stopped. That was that big push. and We even wrote a letter in favor of allowing um, local control over school space. Um, but that has been blocked, never even made it for a vote. So the fourth is the earliest. And, you know, I think like with anything, with any new initiative, as I said to the teachers, um, you know, they're, they're, there's going to be something that we may or may not like about it. And so it's looking at, okay, we're well, looking in the future, what would be some minor tweaks? Or is this something that, hey, we tried it, it's great for this year because we really needed that. Is that something that we would want for our culture across the board, yes or, or, or no? Get some feedback from families, get feedback from staff, um, making decisions that way. Um, but we'd work with staff from now until then to be able to set that schedule and work it out that way. So we'll come back in February. Some ideas? Or some, just looking at Martin Luther King Day, what does that progress out to? Okay. Yeah, so the memo that I've given to you talks about the number of um, seats that we had available for this year. So we opened 97 seats, we enrolled 27. Um, you can see the um, number of the different grade levels that students came into our district, um, as well as the tuition waivers. Um, and um, then on the second page, um, you, you'll notice that we have, uh, for our total number of students um, from in our district that come into our district, we have 173 students. And then it shows where each district those students come from. Um, and then as well, um, our residents that attend out of the district to other public schools, um, whether it's brick and mortar or whether it's virtual. And you can see there are 95 there. Um, it shows our open enrollment history. Um, and um, we can see um, the, the total um, both of open enrollment in as well as, well as open enrollment out. Um, that goes with that. Topher has um, given us the, the, the monetary 
um, impact of open enrollment for us. So it's they're currently estimating that this year it'll be seven thousand fifty-five dollars for regular ed students and twelve thousand two hundred seven for special ed. Um, so open enrollment is expected to generate one point three five eight um, million in revenue, while open enrollment out is expected to cost the district seven hundred forty-three thousand. So it's a, a net increase of six hundred fourteen thousand dollars of revenue. Um, that comes into our district um, through open enrollment. So as we look at our open enrollment seats for 1819 and look at as we move to three section schools, um, we uh, looked at what are some of those grade levels that have um, space available that would not that if we were to accept open enrolled students at that number would not require us to have a either high class sizes or B have to hire another teacher. Um, which then causes you to n not gain revenue, um, but would would result otherwise in smaller class sizes. Um, so we have uh, we are recommending um, one kindergarten student, um, five first grade students, three eighth grade students. With our fifth grade class being so small, we have 14 fifth grade students. Um, looking at our middle school, we looked at. Um, working with Kevin uh, of having six sections and trying to have 150 students at each grade level so it br brings some stability to to their um, to their enrollment um, for scheduling and so forth that there's eight spots available in sixth grade 17 and six and eight in um, eighth sixth and eighth excuse me six and eight um, and then at the high school it's a smaller eighth grade coming in um, and so we look at offering 11 seats in ninth grade um, 10th and 11th and 12th and 12th grade are large class sizes, so there'd be zero in 10th grade, um, two in 11th, and zero in 12th. Um, and Mary Pat, our interim people director, has looked at our caseloads for our special ed class, for our special ed caseloads, and we have no, our caseloads are, um, are above, uh, where we currently are, we're above the state um, average, of, uh, and so they're not, um, we don't have any room to accept special ed students, so we are not recommending to accept any special ed students at this time. Um, and then uh, once once a district can set one time when a family has to reapply um, to stay um, through the open enrollment system, and that for us is um, students from fifth to sixth grade. Um, so we are anticipating those students to stay. Um, they're not part of this um, opening up of 72 seats. Questions? Essentially, the, the board goals are overarching goals adopted by the board and reaffirmed annually based on input from the community. That's, that's the concept here. So these are overarching goals in our meetings and our discussions. We look at surrounding districts. We look at best practices throughout the state where we But those overarching goals would remain subject to board affirmation on an annual basis. We believe that each of the goals should have some level of objectives that would change each year uh, based upon uh, the maintenance of those overarching board goals. Uh, and that those overarching objectives and the goals, the overall goals of the board would be used to inform the superintendent's goals and objectives and the district's goals and objectives. And I, I think if you look at those overarching goals, there's nothing controversial in there. In fact, what we exist for. 
you think that the progress toward the bold, uh, board objective should be measured annually? Uh, the executive committee of the board we should get together sometime in the May June time frame to review our progress relative to those objectives. And, uh, report to the full board how we're doing. The goals may not change but those objectives will and are we gaining on those objectives that we play out. And we also think that as necessary throughout the school year, the district should engage stakeholders in the discussion of the goals and the objectives each year. And to gather their thoughts for how we might be able to or what we might need to consider for future objectives. And that uh, um, our final report on how the board's done relative to those objectives would be presented at a time that we coincide with the finalization, finalization of the superintendents. So that this is all coming together in a plan for the weather. So at this point, unless there's any questions, I think I think we should have a, a future agenda item to to review this and, and to consider some level of adoption by the end of this school as to the next year's our goals as well as the objectives. And I can jump into this mid-year. We're more than halfway through. But that would use this as a guide for us for the future. Any questions? Absolutely. I think we should add an agenda item in February. to a point where by the end of the school year we will be in place to affirm these goals and to either affirm, add, or amend these objectives for the next school year. Great. Do you have any else? I mean, I thought the process that we've done was actually very good and as we've gone through, there are some of the things that are in place that we'll be able to do something like this and we'll tie it all together. Um, it will be something clear that people can see and understand as far as what are those goals, how are we measuring those goals, and how we can obviously put out on them. So I thought it was done very good. And, and it's not without its challenges. There's a lot on the administrative plate right now that we, you know, we're talking about developing of some level of survey and some level of scorecard. I think you indicated in your goals. Mm -hmm. That's on, on the. Mm -hmm. That will be done this year. Right. Yep. We're working on a parent survey, we're working on a staff survey. Um, and um, yep, so we're, we're, we'll have that for this spring um, and um, be using it for everyone in that way. So add it to the agenda and come prepared for this month. All right, any questions for Paul or the committee members? Then we'll put that on the agenda for next mm -hmm. meeting. Okay. Combination of long, long term things. Okay, some board policies. Uh, we didn't have policy uh, committee update. Policy committee update on the agenda. So we're going to do that. So we can speak to that a little bit before. So we, uh, we did meet on January 8th. Um, to go through some second readings that we had for some policies, um, as well as some first um, readings of policies. Um, there were actually five of them that we had that were uh, second readings, um, and seven of them that are first readings um, that we are going to present to the board tonight um, for approval. Um, there are also, um, under M, one, two, three, and four, there's actually there's four that will be uh, repealed. And then the balance of 12 then will be the new ones that we would add for more approval. So we can do these in two blocks. We can make the uh, motion to appeal the board of math and we'll be working to approve. Unless anyone's in, in, in uh, second and third readings have any questions or further discussion, why are you to everybody? Is that what you mean, right? So it doesn't have to check the discussion. But if anything else has come up on further review, somebody wants to. Well, fine as one of those, go ahead and do that now. Otherwise, I'll ask for 
a motion to uh, approve those that have been cited for the appeal. Motion to approve. For the discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And it passes. No motion to approve the policy system in full. Any questions or further discussion on those? I guess I have the rule 34 5. I think just to make sure that the reason is there's a couple of items here. But in 34 5, 345 to 4 rule. Okay. I have reference to the first rule and the date of second. Yeah, that that was old practice that we did that. So that was just in that, and this was one that that we actually didn't look at specifically, but it it was suggested in the policy that that we needed to approve it. So it was more just formatting and correcting the um, the references to the exhibits. I'm just saying mm -hmm. in the future, if we're going through, if we see that there's that, that explanatory data first reading, data second. You want that? that okay. okay. We can do that. Sure. Policy adopted and one was revised. Okay. Yes, so as Jamie's coming up here, um, we, as I mentioned, we met with Hoffman for three hours and um, we have another meeting scheduled in March to continue the discussion, but we came up with some um, some good guidance. I'll be sending an email out to all of our staff um, with some of the information um, that we we gleaned from that day. Um, and I guess the, um, the condensed version is that um, as school gets out, um, we have a week to clean out um, Kennedy and Woodview, and then those buildings will be um, closed and abatement will occur so they can start remodeling those spaces. Um, GES will have an extra week um, to, and then that will be closed and abatement will occur there. Um, the high school, they'll have access to the main office and um, because of strength and conditioning that we need for the weight room for our summer school and for some of our athletic teams, they will be creating a path for kids to be able to get into the weight room, but otherwise um, the majority of the high school will also be off limits as they seal that and get ready for abatement to occur as well. So um, we're looking into um, purchasing some boxes, packing boxes, um, we'll be um, you know, reaching out to um, community members, families, um, students looking for community service hours, um, our own staff um, to be packing some things and looking ahead to what that will look like. Um, and um, and that was sort of the, so we got some good, good, good leg work done on that, some more work to do before May, um, but we came up with some, some good work um, with that um, as construction continues. Before the meeting, we, we did a tour um, with the board and you were able to see some of the things that have occurred at the high school. Um, which is great to see, and those things continue at each of our sites. So, Jamie? Yeah, so I just have a current um, update. So, currently we have uh, three change orders. Um, it's the same amount at each school, so Kennedy, $3,240, um, would be $3,240 in the high school also. And that's pertaining to a load calculation. Uh, it's changed. And this is going to Metro Welding, so they needed to reinforce the roof joists on each gymnasium. So that that is the current uh, change orders that we have. Right here. So as we discussed with the board, if there's anything under twenty-five thousand dollars that we would, in order to keep the projects moving, that we would approve those, but bring them to the board, um, so you're aware of change orders that have come along. Um, and if it's over twenty-five thousand dollars, then we'd reach out so that you would know what that is. 
um, before moving forward, but um, those are the, so we'll start adding that to our construction update if we have any change orders that come along. Questions? No, sir. Okay, I look for a motion to convene in closed session to consider employment promotion compensation and performance evaluation data and administrators over which the board has jurisdiction or exercise of responsibility. Two, to consider performance evaluation data of the superintendent over which the board has jurisdiction or exercise of responsibility. And three, conduct business contract negotiations for which competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. This is in accordance with State statutes 